According to the Director General of the World Health Organization, the three greatest threats facing humanity are the global food crisis, climate change, and pandemic influenza. Now, if you look at your program, you'll realize that all three are being covered this weekend. Factory farms play a role in the three greatest public health threats we face. The 2009 flu pandemic killed tens of thousands of people. But in a world in which millions continue to die of diseases like AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, why was there so much concern? Why is there so much concern about swine flu? Because apparently the last time a nearly entirely new flu virus jumped species and caused a pandemic, it went on to become the deadliest plague in human history, the influenza pandemic of 1918, which killed more people in 25 weeks than AIDS has killed in 25 years. No war, no plague, no famine has ever killed so many people in so short a time. Where did it come from? Well, the conventional wisdom is that the 1918 pandemic was triggered when an H1N1 bird virus in its entirety, all eight gene segments, jumped into human beings. Um, we then apparently passed it along to pigs, sickening millions of them as well. After the pandemic, our human immune systems became used to the virus and became turned into regular seasonal flu, and in pigs, it turned into what's called classic or classical swine flu. Before 1918, there's no pigs um, in history um, recorded ever getting the flu at all. So through the roaring 20s, um, people got the regular flu and pigs got swine flu. Same thing with the 30s, same thing with the 40s. And in the interest of time, I'll skip over the 1957 uh, pandemic, the 1968 pandemic. But as you can see throughout, bur um, excuse me, swine flu was stable through the 1970s in North America and 1980s. But then, by 1999, everything changed. A never before described triple species flu virus arose. The classic swine flu virus, after being stable for 80 years straight, picked up three gene segments from the circulating human flu virus and two gene segments from the bird flu virus to create the first triple animal reassortment virus ever described. Now, our first hybrid, a human a pig viral mutant, was first discovered on a factory farm in Newton Grove, North Carolina, 1998, owned by a massive pork conglomerate called Hogslat. Within months of this discovery, our triple hybrid virus had spread throughout the United States. It soon it spread into Canada, and by 2003, the majority of animals tested in industrial pig operations in Mexico also showed evidence of exposure to our triple hybrid strain. We then exported it to Asia, and then the favor was apparently returned. After shuffling with the classic flu, flu virus, our Made in the USA triple reassortment virus picked up two gene segments from a European Euro Eurasian swine flu line to create the flu pandemic of 2009. The primary progenitor, the main ancestor of our last pandemic virus, as shown in orange there, was our triple hybrid mutant, which first emerged and spread throughout the United States, throughout factory farms in the United States more than a decade ago. Six out of the eight gene segments, three quarters of the pandemic virus straight from our triple hybrid. And this, uh, this diagram, these data, um, uh, come from the most comprehensive genetic analysis to date. Now, influenza experts have been warning about this triple hybrid virus for years, calling an extremely promiscuous uh, mammalian adapted virus. Uh, flu scientists used to only worry about Southeast Asia um, as, uh, um, in terms of uh, the appearance, uh, in terms of a pandemic virus emergence. But given our triple virus mutant, now all we have to do is look in our backyard for the next pandemic virus to appear. And six years after they wrote that, it did. So after eight decades of stability, what happened in the 1990s that led to these unprecedented changes in swine flu? And the same thing with bird flu. No human deaths from avian flu for eight decades until 1997, when H5N1 started killing people in Hong Kong, then H7. 
N7, a bird flu emerged in the Netherlands, which went on to infect 1,000 people with confirmed human-to-human -human transmission. Just two examples of new bird flu viruses circulating um, and infecting people. Now, in poultry, the number of outbreaks of highly pathogenic, highly disease-causing um, avian influenza in the first few years of this century has already exceeded the total number of outbreaks for the entire previous uh, century, as one leading flu expert told science, we've gone from a few snowflakes to an avalanche. What's been happening in recent years to trigger this kind of evolution and fast forward for both swine and chicken flu viruses? Let's ask the world's leading expert, Dr. Robert Webster, as did the senior correspondent of NewsHour with Jim Lair. Was there something was there something uh, qualitatively different about this, this last decade that made it possible for this virus to do something it's never done before, some kind of changing conditions that suddenly lit a match to the tinder? Dr. Webster replied. He, talks, he says, um, farming practices have changed. He talks about growing up on a farm. He says, but now we put millions of chickens into a chicken factory next door to a pig factory. And this virus has the opportunity to get into one of these chicken factories and make billions and billions of mutations continuously. Um, and so that's what we've changed. We've changed the way we raise animals. And it goes on to say how then the virus can escape from these factory farms, infect wild birds. It says that's what's changed, the way we raise animals. Seven years ago, the world's three leading authorities got together, the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and the World Organization for Animal Health, the world's leading veterinary authority. And their job was to uncover the key underlying causes of these emerging animal-to-human diseases. And number one on their list of key themes of risk factors was this increasing demand for animal protein the world over. Now, animals were domesticated 10,000 years ago, but uh, never before like this especially pigs and poultry. You know, chickens used to kind of peck around the barnyard, but now chickens raised for meat are warehoused in sheds containing tens of thousands of birds. Half of the egg-laying hens on this planet are now intensively confined in battery cages, these small wire barren um, enclosures extending down long rows and windowless sheds. There can be up to a million birds on a single farm. And about half of the world's pig population is also now crowded in these industrial confinement operations. Right? You know, old McDonald's farm got replaced by the new McDonald's farm. Right? These intensive systems represent the most profound alterations of the human-animal relationship in 10,000 years. No surprise, perhaps, that they have been shown to be repeatedly breeding grounds for disease. A few snapshots before we get back to influenza. China, 2005, the world's leading producer of pork, suffers an unprecedented outbreak of emerging pig pathogen called strep suis, causing meningitis and deafness in people handling infected pork products. Hundreds of people infected with the deadliest strain on record. Why? Well, the World Health Organization blames these intensive confinement conditions. The USDA elaborates. All strep suis appears to start out harmless, asymptomatic, as normal gut flora. But then stress-induced immune suppression from the overcrowding, right? Poor ventilation allows this bug to go invasive, causing infections of the brain, blood, lungs, heart, and death. Starts out harmless, turns deadly. That's what these conditions may be able to do. This is not arguably how animals were meant to live. Pig factories in Malaysia birthed the Nipah virus, one of the deadliest of human pathogens, contagious respiratory disease, killing about 40% of people it infects. This is actually what the movie Contagion was um, modeled after. And, uh, and again, according to one of the leaders of the field, it seems to be the way in which we are now um, forcing animals t to live. 2009, a strain of Ebola was reported on a factory farm um, in the Philippines, confining 6,000 pigs. 
Ebola restin, this is the same strain featured in the hot zone, an airborne Ebola, but doesn't appear to transmit to people with enough time to mutate in pigs, though, who knows? So they drove them into these pits and then burned them alive. What better example of the link between how we treat farm animals and potential public health implications than our investigation of cruelty against sick and crippled dairy cows, which prompted U.S. authorities to initiate the largest meat recall in human history for violating food safety rules meant to protect the public from bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease, a disease that wouldn't even exist had it not been for factory farming practices. We took natural herbivores, cows and sheep, turned them into carnivores and cannibals, and then we took downed animals, too sick to even stand, fed them to people, and now we have mad cow disease. We feed antibiotics by the truckload to farmed animals. Here's the total number of antibiotics used for all of human medicine every year. Contrast that with how much it's fed to farm animals just to promote growth and prevent disease in such a stressful, crowded environment. Millions of pounds a year, and now we as physicians are um, facing these multi-drug resistant bacteria and running out of good antibiotic options. Why do half of the pigs tested so far in the United States have MRSA, MRSA, the so-called superbug that now kills more people than AIDS every year in the United States? As, Brit as Britain's chief medical officer put it in his annual report, every inappropriate use of antibiotics in agriculture is signing a death warrant, potentially, for a future patient. Now, such use has its opponents as well as its advocates. The feeding of critically important medical antibiotics to pigs and chickens just to fatten them faster is condemned by the American Medical Association, but approved by the American Meat Institute. The American Academy of Pediatrics opposed versus the National Turkey Federation. The American Public Health Association is against it, but the American Sheep Industry Association is for it. The National Academies of Sciences Institute of Medicine opposed the National Chicken Council in favor of the World Health Organization on one side versus the Pork Producers Council on the other. Now, to be fair, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is also in favor, along with the United Egg Producers. Um, on the other hand, this practice has been condemned by nearly every medical organization in the United States. Yet industrial animal agriculture continues this dangerous practice. Sometimes they're fed antibiotics, arsenic, other drugs, and sometimes farmed animals aren't fed at all. Forced starvation molting where laying hens can have food withheld for weeks, water deprived for days, causing a loss of up to a third of their body weight, but see, this allows the industry to shock their systems to another round of laying before they are killed. Yes, huge increases in stress and suffering and mortality. But uh, for our purposes this morning, what does it do to salmonella? Now normally, for those of you who have been eating your carrots and can read this uh, small time, it takes up to 56,000 salmonella bacteria. Um, to trigger infection, but starvation makes hens so immunocompromised that uh, um, less than 10 bacteria, not uh, 6,000, not 56,000, but less than 10 can trigger infection. Then once infected, starving hens then shed 10,000 times more salmonella, placing consumers at risk. Remember the big recall last year? A mere half billion eggs recalled um, because of salmonella? Well, guess what may have caused it, according to Egg Industry Magazine. This is their trade journal. Maybe flocks were subjected to a post-Easter induction of molt using starvation. Why would they do that? Why would they place the public at risk? The first and most important reason is that it improves profits, according to the industry. Right? 
The same reason that laying hens are crammed in these barren battery cages. But in 64 days from today, all 27 nations of the European Union are banning these cages. What effect might this have on public health? Well, analysis was carried out by the European Food Safety Authority, kind of their FDA, looking at 30,000 samples taken from more than 5,000 farms across two dozen countries. This is what they found. Seminole and Teridus, compared to cages, 43% lower odds of salmonella in cage-free versus cages, right? and 98% lower odds in free-range, 95% lower odds in organic egg production. Salmonella typhimurium, the leading uh, salmonella um, uh, cause of salmonella poisoning in the United States, 77% lower odds in cage-free versus cage, and then 95% lower odds um, of salmonella in free-range and organic. So the elimination of cages would be expected to dramatically lower the risk of salmonella infection. And then for the other salmonella serotypes found, compared to heads in cages, we had 96, 99, 98% lower odds of being contaminated. And so the European Food Safety Authority concluded the obvious cage flock holdings are more likely to be contaminated with salmonella. But why? Well, the European Food Safety Authority analysis suggests three factors. The higher prevalence of salmonella in caged flocks um, uh, may be in part explained by the fact that these hens are in more intensive systems, have a higher risk of being infected due to, number one, the sheer density um, uh, and uh, number and packing density of these animals. Number two, the cages can be difficult to disinfect. The cage equipment itself, um, as salmonella has been shown to be more persistent in caged flocks because infection uh, can't be more easily cleaned out. And number three, batter cage operations breed more rodents, flies, and other disease vectors. So number one, increased stocking density. This is a view from beneath the cages looking up, gives you a sense of the kind of less than a sheet of paper living space these animals have um, to live their lives in. Um, uh, and because they're stacked like this vertically, um, then you know, 100,000 hens or more can be caged um, under a single roof in a single shed. So it kind of makes sense that you know, higher densities of birds packed in the same confined space can produce a higher volume of contaminated airborne fecal dust. Number two, and lots of it, uh, salmonella can survive for more than two years in dried fecal matter but uh, can be eliminated from a hen's houses through proper cleaning and disinfection. Experts have noted, though, that battery cage operations are the most difficult to clean properly because of the difficulty in disinfecting the cages themselves, even saturating cage operations with um, uh, formaldehyde spiked steam for 24 hours straight, the gold standard treatment, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, found to effectively sterilize um, cage-free barns may not effectively disinfect battery cage hens, uh, sheds. And so the next flock you put in the cages are just going to get reinfected. And number three, the preponderance of disease-carrying rodents, flies, and other pests in these battery cage sheds. This is a view below the cages, so the cages are up here, down in the manure pit, where the droppings drop 10 tons of excrement dropped every day in these kind of facilities. And these pits are ideal nesting grounds, as you can imagine, for rodents, the presence of which is a major factor for salmonella spread. Uh, now, there are rodents in cage-free production, but if you can read this, it is the cage houses um, that are particularly persistent because they can breed unfettered in these manure pits underneath and can gain access to the feeders without interference from the birds, who by definition are confined in cages and can't just kind of peck them away. According to the latest edition of the leading uh, poultry science textbook, one of the many disadvantages of these battered cage operations is that flies, generally a greater nuisance compared to cage-free production, more than merely a nuisance, flies are proven vectors of salmonella on egg farms. And by far, the, so, um, the greatest uh, concentration of these so-called filth flies is found in cage layer houses. One reason the 
greatest numbers of disease carrying flies occurs in cages because of the, you know, again, the flies can breed unfettered in these massive manure pits. Three factors used to identify uh, why the caging hens has consistently been tied to higher risk. Now, skip number four in the interest of time, and number five cages are riskier is because of stress, right? Hens are unable to perform natural behaviors like nesting. When you have a million birds in a farm, you know, there's no individualized veterinary attention. In fact, they may be forced to live among the corpses of their cage mates, become matted down like pancakes, as you saw, um, live their whole lives like the same cage for um, over a year before they're killed. Another new study, this is in the International Journal of Medical Microbiology. Researchers found that the stress hormones themselves can increase salmonella colonization and systemic spread in chickens. Um, uh, greater concentrations of the stress hormone norepinephrine or noradrenaline means greater salmonella growth and spread within these animals. In fact, you can do it right in a petri dish. As the concentration of stress hormone um, increases as you kind of go clockwise here, you can see an acceleration in salmonella growth. Right? Um, stress hormones are like fuel for salmonella. And not only may the growth rate of salmonella bacteria be boosted by literally orders of magnitude by circulating stress hormones, uh, stress-related corticosteroids can impair, can cripple a bird's immune system um, here. This is uh, crippling antibody production in chickens. Right? So you kind of have it from both ends. Whichever the reason, the best available science uh, shows that intensive confinement can significantly increase the risk of infection, and this translates out to human risk. Um, eating eggs from caged birds, for example, has been directly tied to human illness. Prospective case control study published in the American Journal of, uh, of Epidemiology. Those eating um, battery cage eggs, twice the odds of suffering salmonella infection. Um, and again, if you can see this, whether white or brown, um, caged eggs significantly more risk um, than cage-free or organic. Now, I'm not saying organic eggs are safe. There's just an outbreak of salmonella up in Minnesota tied to organic eggs this month, but this data suggests that cage-free and organic um, are safer um, than those um, uh, created under these more extreme factory farming practices. In all, USDA and CDC estimates that eggs alone may in fact may sicken more than 100,000 people, 100,000 cases of salmonella-borne um, uh, uh, food poison in the United States every year. So egg-borne salmonella is an epidemic every year in the United States. But influenza has the potential to infect billions. What about the increasing numbers of flu viruses jumping from farmed animals to people? The so-called, now oh, you really got to eat your carrots. The, um, the acceleration, I'll read it to you, the acceleration of human influenza problems in recent years. So to review, here's all the new influenza viruses infecting people up to um, 2005, so this is 1918, 1957, 1968, but then you can see just kind of um, um, in the last few years, um, uh, this kind of, uh, kind of snowflakes to an avalanche in people too, but why? Well, according to the world's leading agriculture authority, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the acceleration of uh, human influenza problems in recent years, quote, is expected to largely relate to the intensification of poultry production and possibly pig production as well, unquote. So what does the poultry industry think about the possibility that its factory farms could you know, birth a virus that could go on and uh, kill millions of people? Well, the executive editor of Poultry Magazine uh, wrote an editorial on just that topic, the prospect of a virulent flu to which we have absolutely no resistance uh, is, uh, is uh, frightening. However, to me, the threat is much greater to the poultry industry. I'm not as worried about, uh, I'm not as worried about the human population dying from bird flu as I am that there will be no chicken to eat. There are at least 10 reasons why industrial pork production uh, can also present a breeding ground for disease. That operation in Newton Grove, North Carolina, where our first hybrid swine, mo swine flu virus was discovered, was a breeding facility in which thousands of sows were confined in gestation crates, also known as sow stalls. Right? So these are veal 
crate-like barren metal stalls, only about two feet wide, highly intelligent social animals, as you heard from Dr. Balcom, uh, basically kept in a box, right? Week after week, month after month. Um, they can develop crippling joint deformities, lameness. If we did this to a dog, you'd get thrown in jail, right? Um, but not only can these pregnant pigs not um, turn around, they can barely move at all. And the rise in stress hormone levels in these crated sows is thought to be because of interference with the expression of natural, normal maternal behaviors, like nest building. And this frustration of normal behavior may result in impaired immunity. And again, why does it matter if pigs have impaired immunity? Because the viruses that appear there and bacteria may then spread to people. Measures as simple as providing straw bedding may decrease morbidity and mortality compared to these concrete slatted floors, presumably by eliminating the immunosuppressive stress of lying on bare concrete their whole lives, which leads to increased uh, infection risk. This minimal act, providing straw, right, has been shown to decrease the risk of swine flu. For anyone who's German is a little rusty, uh, table two risk factors associated with influenza, swine flu, swine influenza infection, compared to straw bedding, um, those uh, in uh, uh, slatted floors had two and a half times the infection risk. Right? Yet we often divide, deny them even this modicum of mercy uh, to both their detriment and potentially to ours as well. The National Livestock and Meat Board defends intensive confinement, though, in a pamphlet called Facts from the meat board. Confinement rearing has its precedence. Well, look, schools are, are examples of confinement rearing of children. <laughs> Not that different from how they describe veal crates as similar to a baby's crib. The fact that the industry feels the need to mislead consumers by conjuring images of you know, baby's cribs in schools um, speaks to how far out of step animal agriculture is from just basic decency towards animals, and they know it. As uh, Professor Emeritus of Animal Science wrote in one of his college textbooks, one of the best things animal, modern animal agriculture has going for it is that most people haven't a clue about how animals are raised. For modern animal agriculture, the less the consumer knows before meat hits the plate, the better. Right? Now, our greatest fear is that the human transmissibility of H1N1, swine flu, could potentially combine with the human lethality of um, H5N1, uh, highly pathogenic bird flu, and create a virus um, uh, where, I mean, the lethality of bird flu right now is 60%. Don't even get a coin toss as to whether or not you live through this virus. Only infected a few hundred people, though. But what if they combine in one of these areas in the world where those viruses are both endemic? Right? We do not want to have billions of people infected with a virus capable of infecting, of killing 60% of those infected. So what can we do to prevent this kind of thing in the future? The United Nations has urged that governments, local authorities, international agencies need to take a greatly increased role in combating the role of factory farming. This is the United Nations speaking, right? which combined with the roles with these live bird markets provide ideal conditions for the virus, um, to, for a uh, bird flu virus to spread and mutate um, into a more dangerous form. Right? So factory farms can be thought of as incubators for dangerous strains of the flu. Eight years ago, the American Public Health Association, the largest and oldest association of public health professionals in the world, called for a moratorium on factory farming. The journal of the APHA published an editorial that went beyond just calling for de-intensification of the pork and poultry industries. The editorial questions the prudence of raising so many animals for food in the first place. It's curious that changing the way animals live um, uh, the way humans treat animals, most basically ceasing to eat them, or at least in the very least radically limiting the quantity of them that is eaten, is largely off the radar as a significant preventive measure. Such a change, though, if sufficiently adopted or imposed, could still reduce the chances of the much feared influenza epidemic. It would even more likely prevent unknown future diseases 
um, that in the absence of that change may result from farming animals intensively and killing them for food, yet humanity doesn't even consider the option. Right? We don't tend to shore up the levees until after the disaster strikes. The editorial cons um, uh, concludes, those who consume animals not only harm themselves, um, harm those animals and endanger themselves, they also threaten the well-being of future generations on this planet. It's time for humans to remove their heads from the sand um, and recognize the risk to themselves that can arise from our maltreatment of other species. How we treat animals can have global public health implications. Um, finally, you know, I'm often asked how the industry reacts to these kind of pronouncements from the public health community. Well, a few summers ago, the United Nations published yet another report on the global health risks associated with factory farms, um, along with one of our most prestigious public health institutions, Johns Hopkins. Um, let me show you what kind of reception it got from U.S. agribusiness. Feedstuffs is America's leading agribusiness publication. An editorial responded this way to the FAO research report. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations claims to use scientists to generate reports, but I wonder if those scientists don't resemble a bearded guy living in a cave in Pakistan who wants the U.S. on its knees. Right? Maybe Obama should send a strike team. For those interested in a more in-depth look, um, I do have a few copies of my book, Bird Flu, here, which is available free, full text, at birdflubook.org. Uh, now, this details the infectious disease implications of factory farming. I will leave the chronic disease implications to Dr. Furman tomorrow morning, um, but I do have my uh, latest nutrition DVD here as well. Um, and as you heard in the introduction, hundreds of my videos on more than 1,000 topics are available. Um, at nutritionfacts.org. Everything's free, new video uploaded every day. Let me end with a quote from the World Health Organization. The bottom line. The bottom line is that, that humans have to think about how they treat their animals, how they farm them, how they market them. Basically, the whole relationship between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom is coming under stress. In this age of emerging diseases, we now have billions of feathered and curly-tailed test tubes for viruses to incubate and mutate within billions more spins at pandemic roulette. Along with human culpability, though, comes hope. If changes in human behavior can cause new plagues, well, then changes in human behavior may prevent them in the future. Thank you.